Yeah, I wanted to ask you about the title of your YouTube channel. It's, as you mentioned, um, Fiction Technician, which I really like. I love that name. Um, so what made you interested in um, writing about writing or, or, or in this case, uh, vlogging, I guess? But yeah, I, you know, it's just a thing I thought I could do. Um, I think I watched some video on the Save the Cat story structure and I was like, I could do that better. And, um, and then I made my first video and I don't know that it was better. It was very, you know, shaky because it was my first video, very sort of um, underproduced and anything. awkward. Uh, <laughs> but the more I got into it, the more excited I was about just sharing my thoughts about writing. And uh, one thing I've really learned is that there is no better way to learn something than to teach it. Uh, yes, exactly. Because, oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. So many um, of my videos, you know, I've started out with an idea for it, but then as I have to clarify my my opinions so that I can really express them clearly to the viewer, um, it really clarifies them for me. And then suddenly I have a whole new level of understanding that I really didn't have before I began preparing that video. Yes, exactly. Yes, I agree with you 100%. Um, okay, so... Do you know what I mean by a truck novel? Oh yeah, yeah, like a book um, that you've just decided to go ahead and uh, that's going to just be interred underneath my bed, you know? Anything, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have I have uh, like a shoe boxes, spacious shoe boxes that I just put it in there, put the lid on, shove it underneath my bed, and there you go. Oh, um, you have a physical trunk novel. My, my <laughs> trunk novels are only digital. <laughs> Well, there we go. Yeah. Uh, it took me a while to get away from printing out my novels and just working yeah. on them digitally. Uh, so I, I was wondering, like, you don't have to share anything about anything that you do not want to. Like, I don't want to make you at all feel uncomfortable, but I'm just wondering, like, how many truck novels do you have if you feel like talking about that? Yeah, I've got one real serious truck novel that, you know, I completed, I edited, um, and tried to publish, wasn't successful with it. And um, ultimately I just sort of felt like I had grown beyond it and I wanted to do something else. Um, and then, you know, I have little bits of novels that I have put a hundred pages into and abandoned. I have a fantasy that I still really like and will probably never write and other things. Well, you never know, you never know. You never know. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's great because I, I think that one question that a lot of writers have, especially when they're just starting out, is how do I know if my novel is ready to send out? Or how do I know, like I've sent it out um, and it's just going around and around. Like, should I, should I trunk it and start over? Like, could you say a few words about how you made those kind of decisions? Right. I mean, I don't feel that I sat down and made a clear decision about it. I think I more um, paused querying on that novel, started working on another, and by the time, I, you know, perhaps six months had passed, um, by the time I was deeply into that novel, I just knew that it was much better, and I wasn't really interested in pursuing the original novel. The original novel was called Publish and Perish, and it was going to be a cozy mystery set in a, um, a academic English department uh, okay. at a college. So, um, so yeah, so cozies typically are sold in series. If you sell a cozy to a publisher, they're going to want the second and the third and the fourth. And um, yeah, with this second novel I was working on, which became The Black Rose Murders, I simply didn't want to tie myself to Publish and Parish, which I felt was just weaker but it wasn't exactly love like that title I, though love that oh, title. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> thank you but it wasn't really that I decided um this book is not good enough to pursue anymore it's more that I decided that I no longer wished to be tied to it right no that makes sense yeah okay thank you I remember a few years ago I wrote a, a couple of blog posts about voice 
and yeah. how to um, and how it happens that an author develops their voice. Could you say anything about that writing? Just a, a lot of writing, or did you do any exercise? Like, did you try to write in different authors' voices to explore their voice, and then in that way try to find out find what was unique to your own? Right. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I remember being back in college and thinking that my voice was something I was going to have to invent. Was my voice going to be urbane? Was it going to be casual? Was it going to be colloquial? You know, what, what decisions did I need to make about the voice? And what I discovered after, you know, writing for years is your voice, it, it's, it's nothing terribly arcane. Your voice is just you. It's um, your enthusiasms, your passion. So, um, do you know the cooking show Good Eats? Oh um, yes, I love that. Yeah. yeah, I love that show. And if you go back and watch the first episodes, they're much less um, less quirky, less personality in them. They're still the focus on a scientific view of cooking, mm. but it's just a lot less buoyant and um, over the top and just as the episodes go on, you know, he starts leaning more into his passions for, for particular things, for the science, but other things as well. He starts, you know, letting his connection to Southern culture show, he just starts showing more and more of him. And I think that's your voice. When you yeah. lean into your passions, when you show the things that are interesting to you even if you don't think they're going to be interesting to every member of the potential audience but they're interesting to you that essentially is your voice that's what people connect to and see as you yeah no that's very well said I love that example that's Alton Brown right yeah yeah yeah, yeah. I love his his Twitter handle I think it's it's Thyme Lord <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> I, I, I expect he watches a lot of Doctor Who, but... Um, yeah, probably yay. so. Yes, so I was thinking about motivation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think this is something that a lot of writers have trouble with. Do you, can you, do you have anything that you could say about how you motivate yourself to write? Do you have any like writing exercises that you use or do you tend to write at a particular time of day or do you have a particular place that you, that you write in or just, I don't know if you could just talk, say anything about that. Yeah, okay, so I think um, one thing I've, I've kind of learned recently is that motivation, focusing on motivation is a sucker's game. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no, 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 no. That, that's that's not what I mean. I, I'm just trying to explain. Um, no, no, I, I know, I know. I recently read uh, Tiny Habits by B.J. Fogg, and he talks about how to create habits, and I think that's what you want to focus on. Okay. It's habit formation, not motivation, because your motivation goes up and down from day to day. You know, you get tired. Your motivation slags. Uh, you also have conflicting motivations. You want to write the book. You also want to dork around on the web, you know? Um, and, but if you focus on habits and making it easier for yourself to sit down and do the work, you know, um, get rid of any distractions that are preventing you from doing that, set a quota if that works for you, um, that's what's going to enable you to put consistent words on the page. Um, so yeah, I guess one of the things he says in the book is, you know, don't focus on motivation because it is very hard to hack your motivation. It is much easier to hack how easy an action is to take and that's going to make you do it. Mm, I like that. Yes, I'm a big believer in. So would you say that people should aim to write daily? I, I really do think it makes such a difference. Um, so that is something I'm working on right now. I have a Facebook group called the Quarter Million Word Challenge. And okay. the idea behind this is just to write 685 words a day, which over the course of a year is a quarter million words, which is a lot. Um, so I developed the idea for this challenge after reading Chris Fox's 5,000 words in an hour, um, which is about, you know, putting out oh, a yeah. lot of word count. And I was like, okay, well, what would be like a really aspirational, really wonderful word count to hit for the year? Um, quarter million, because 
that would let me do two books and still have some room left over for novellas or lead magnets or whatever. Um, and yeah, so I think having the daily quota really, A, it helps me just put out many more words than I would otherwise, because even on bad days, I'm frequently putting up some words and it just all adds up, but also B, it really makes me aware of where are the stumbling blocks in my life that are preventing me from getting words on the page? You know, it, for example, a couple of weeks ago, one of the little boys, or actually, I don't know whether it was a boy or girl. Um, one of the kids in my son's class got COVID. And so they crashed oh, the class for a couple of weeks and went virtual. And mm -hmm. um, so my kids were around mm -hmm. all the time. Oh, dear. And <laughs> this, was, th this was a big problem with hitting my word quota, but it just makes me aware that, okay, well, I need to develop some strategies for dealing with those days when I don't have help with childcare because those days are gonna happen, like especially over the summer. And this is an area that I need to focus on in order to continue getting the kind of output that I want to. Would you say like on a day when you are just not able to meet your word quota, would you say that it's better to just say, okay, that didn't happen moving on. I'll just meet it next day. Net, like, I'll just meet it tomorrow. Or would you try to make up for it? I, I don't think you can make up for it. I think um, it, you wind up... Um, you wind up kind of in a hole of despair that way, or at least I Pit do. of despair. Princess yeah, yeah, Bride reference, despair. gotta like it. <laughs> um, but you know, it, it it's a very kind of gutting feeling to sit down and be like, okay, well, you know, I didn't get there yesterday. So today it's gonna be a thousand words. And then maybe today it goes wrong. And tomorrow I'm like, okay, well, 1600 words. And then the next day, perhaps I'm like, okay, it, this has reached an impossible, mountain of words now I guess I'll just go for a walk I you know I um yeah when I'm trying to structure habits for myself I'm I do try to structure things where if I have a setback the motivation doesn't go down with the setback um so what I'm trying to do with my quarter million word challenge is not to actually hit a quarter million words I'm just trying to hit the quota on as many days of 2021 as I can. And, you know, if I miss okay. a day, I miss a day, but the very next day I can hit my quota and be back in the game. Have you heard of, uh, I think it's Jerry Seinfeld had the um, word. Yeah. He, yeah, yeah. He prints out uh, a yearly calendar, like all on one page. And then he puts a red X through the days when he has completed his writing goals. Yeah, and I think that is a, I mean, I think that's a phenomenal way of just kind of keeping yourself motivated because, um, so that does, you know, give you the feeling of, well, I don't want to miss even a day. I have like 20 days in now. If I miss a day, it will take me 20 days to get back to where I was. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, all right. Oh, and um, I, I don't know, I can, I can take this out, uh, I can snip it out, but um, if you, is it an open group, your Facebook group? Oh yeah, absolutely. So um, anybody can search quarter million word challenge on Facebook and you'll find me. It's a, it's a small group right now, but okay. you know, small but feisty and determined to set good writing habits in 2021. Yeah, I'll try to find that. And if I do, I'll put the link in the description. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so if that kind of segues into the next, uh, I, I wanted to talk to you about time management, <laughs> which really we've just been talking about, you know, because like uh, you have, you know, you, you write, you have your awesome YouTube channel, you have four children. <laughs> How do you find the time? I mean, I would say I'm not an expert in time management. I would say um, it's always a struggle for me. So. Um, my kids right now, um, three are in school and then one is in preschool. And so I've got like two hours, 40 minutes while he's in school. Um, it's, it's three hours, but take out the travel time. It's two hours, 40 minutes. And I try 
very hard to spend that on writing. Mm -hmm. um, and it, I mean, the biggest trick I have there is that I use my net blocker, which is freedom. Um, and for me, that's just magical. Like it, um, I don't know, I, I turn it on and then suddenly I can work. Um, I remember reading this sci-fi novel years ago where a character had a um, he had an implant in his brain so that he could just put himself to sleep. Uh, mm -hmm. But he still found it hard to sleep sometimes because he just found it hard to make that decision to oh. activate the implant. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes I feel like that with freedom. I feel like I just have a hard time making the decision to start up a writing session and commit to not being on the net. But as soon as I do, it's magical for me. Um, so that's a big thing. And then YouTube, I just uh, kind of try to work in around the edges. So I think um, sometimes I have let YouTube be the lead in my life. Like the YouTube gets done when it went on deadline and then the writing gets done around the edges. And I'm trying to flip that now because really the YouTube channel is intended to support the writing and not the other way around. Right, right. Um, so I get the feeling that you just answered my next question. Like, so you tend to write in the same time block every day. Yeah. Do you have a place that you like to write? Like, cause we, we, you were talking about habit formation and right. I, I, is that something that's conducive to habit formation? Like to write at the same time in the same place or it doesn't really matter. It's more just sticking to whatever schedule you have. Yeah, I think it's, it's um, more sticking to whatever habits are working for you. For me, I, I do like to switch up the place. Um, I do like to occasionally go out to a coffee shop or go to the library, um, although that's harder now with COVID. Um, but yeah, I, I could, um, I don't know, switching my place does definitely give me a little burst of productivity for a time. So mm. I could probably, you know what, I think I'm going to uh, think about designing a habit where I switch up my place every two weeks and okay. see if that helps out. Okay, that's a really good suggestion. Okay, so I'm going to transition now a little bit and, oh. um, and talk more about like the business of writing. Mm -hmm. um, like you, you have, it was your debut novel uh, yeah. in, in the, in the store that was, um, put my glasses on. The Black Rose Murders. Now, yeah. do you have that? I, 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 I meant to look, but I, I didn't see. Do you have that on Kindle Unlimited? Yes, it is. Okay, would you recommend Kindle Unlimited to other writers? Like, what have you found with that? So I honestly feel that I am not an expert um, okay. on this particular question. Um, so I'm going to refer people to who I think is a wonderful expert on this topic, which is David Gogren. Um, oh, yes, he is really good. Yeah, R-A-N. Um, yeah, and so I don't know. I feel like... Um, so. The Black Rose Murders was completed probably before my first daughter was born. And then I felt like I still had editing to do. And, um, but eventually I got to a point where I was like, well, I simply am never going to have a lot of time for writing. And I just want to keep my hand in. I, you know, you hear about people who become overnight successes, but really they actually had eight books on the shelf and number eight was a big hit. So I simply wanted to keep my hand in, start building that backlist and figured that I would learn more about the business as I went along. So it is in Kittle Unlimited because that is easy, but I do want to kind of reevaluate that decision as I go along. Okay, sounds cool. Um... Okay, so I did some light stalking on you. Uh -huh. 
Uh, so your YouTube channel, I was looking, I was looking at it and noticed that your oldest published video is about one year old. Is yeah. that about when you, you started it? Um, again, you, uh, October the 2nd, 2019, it tattles on you when, when you uh, got it. Right. Yeah. So, um, and you already have 575 subscribers. Uh, yeah. That's, that's pretty good. I think that's really oh, good. Thanks. thanks. And uh, so would you care to talk about uh, like your YouTube journey and, um, you know, maybe give owners of smaller channels like myself, you know, some advice about how to, sure. how to grow the channel? Yeah, absolutely. So again, you know, what I said about um, the best way to learn something is to teach it is true. And, um, you know, for me, that's been a huge gain from the YouTube channel, even if I had no subscribers. And even if um, this was not helping me build my platform, I would still feel that I had gained so much as a writer. Um, also, I'd like to say that any skill you want, you can pick up. Like it, when I started, I didn't know anything. I didn't know how to record. I didn't know how to light myself. I didn't know how to uh, get good audio. I didn't know how to edit the video. I, I could go on and on. Um, it's like 10 different skills that I've had to pick up to do this channel. But I've just put them together over time. You just can get there. So, you know, whatever tr you're trying to learn, whether it's for writing or for YouTube, just trust that you can get there over time. And um, that it's still, even if you're not where you want to be in skill level yet, it's still a really good idea to start. For me, every time I have started taking myself more seriously, putting myself out there more, and asking the world to take me more seriously, it has been a good bet. Um, you know, yeah, it's not that say that's that true. success has been quick or easy, but it has always been the right thing to do. Mm, nice. So would you say like when you first started it, were you like, how? what were the feelings around that? Were you nervous? Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> I still am. I still am. Really? I you don't look nervous. And I try to look casual and confident. But in fact, I, I, uh, my heart is often racing when I'm recording. Really? Because no, you look really relaxed and just like in command of the material and just, yeah, it was very good. Um, so what made you, uh, I think you kind of touched on this and maybe in a couple of the things that, that you have said, but, um, but, but it, it was, it's kind of a big thing, like to start a YouTube channel. I, what made you want to do that? Um, so I guess it was that, um, yeah, I, it was, um, the one save the cat video. I just, I thought I could do a really good job with it. And, okay. and then there was another video I really wanted to make, which is on flow. So flow is, um, it's what psychologists call that state of being in the zone where you're just mm -hmm. deep in your work, uh, time races by without you even noticing. And, um, I felt like I had a lot of things to say about how to engineer the flow state, how to get into the flow state faster. And um, I just really wanted to share that with the world. And then once I, once I did that, I just wanted to keep going. Okay, and I have to ask, I have to ask, this is totally unfair because you're not prepared for this, but could you give the people who are, who are listening and, and me like one tip about how to get into the flow, the flow state? Okay, so my best tip. Okay, all right. I'm. I'm going to talk a little bit about flow. So flow has like um, psychologists have um, identified like eight qualities flow has. Um, clear goals. So for example, um, if you're a surgeon and you're doing surgery, you know what you need to do, not just overall, but you know what you need to do at each step along the way. Now I need to cut this artery. Now I need to sew this suture. And so tasks like surgery tend to be more conducive to causing, uh, you know, to helping people generate flow mm. than tasks like say parenting, where it's often very unclear what you need to be doing next. And I think writing 
writing is kind of towards the more unclear side, you know, um, you know, you need to be writing the next paragraph, but what should that paragraph contain? And um, you know, which of many directions might you take the scene? So my best tip for flow is if you feel like you're in a really kludgy place with your writing and you're not sure what happened next, drill down, go down to a lower level of task. You know, if, um, if you're not sure what should happen next, then just ask yourself, well, have I defined what the purpose of this scene is? And um, could I write a list of five things that might happen next? And, but just keep drilling down to a lower and lower level until you feel like, okay, I have a very clear idea of what, um, what my next task is and I can do that task. So would you say that an outline, I know there's this, this controversy, like pantsers and plotters, right? But would you say that an outline would help, what, you're, you're a plotter? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I love outlines. So I love, I love structure. I love checklists and Excel and um, yeah. Uh, so yeah, I always start off with an outline and kind of each scene has a name. And I have like seven questions I ask myself about each scene um, to try and make sure that it's set up with enough conflict that it's going to be interesting. And um, yeah, I really believe in outlining. I know for some people that kills the creativity, but for me, I I don't want to wait. I don't want to write twenty thousand words that I'm going to throw out. Like I want to. I would rather spend that time plotting. And for me, the plotting is the funnest part. Yeah, 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 I know I can see that. Did you start off that way or did you transition towards using the outline? Um, it's a really good question. Um, yeah, I think I've become much more of an outliner over time. I think, um, yeah, for me, it's just, um, it's super frustrating to find that I have most of a book written and there's a major part that doesn't work. Um, well, I guess, honestly, that still happens <laughs> even with the outline sometimes. Um, oh, well, I think but, it happens to every, like, is your outline, I mean, if, for me, uh, it's not it's not set in stone. I mean, it changes. Like I'll yeah. I'll be inspired and then I change the outline and then you know it's it's a back and forth kind of process. Yeah, yeah. I think I've definitely become much more of an outliner over time, and it just um, yeah, it's become a really exciting part of the process for me, where I kind of get to see in miniature what my story is going to be like and um, where I may, might want to make changes. Well, what's his name? James Patterson, I think. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he's a uh, fake yeah, outliner. Big and, and of course, he, yeah. I think he, he makes, you know, millions of dollars a year. So there's yeah. that to recommend it. Um, okay, so this is an unfair question. But you mentioned seven questions that you asked yourself oh, when yeah. writing a scene. Now, I don't expect you to, rem to remember all of them off the top of your head. But do you, have you done a YouTube video on that? Um, yeah, so I have a YouTube video. It's, um, it's actually kind of a hybrid where I show you how to create um, metadata in Scrivener. And so Scrivener is the word processor I use. And basically in each file, I have my metadata with my seven questions. Um, so oh, right, right. So right in each template. scene, yeah. I can just fill out all these questions for myself as part of my outlining process. Um, and then I go through the seven questions. Um, yeah, uh, so one of them, for example, is um, I try to map out um, three strategies for each character to move through in the scene. So like I'm writing a scene between two characters and I want them both to kind of be proactive and dynamic and not totally dominated by the other. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'll try to map out three escalating strategies they'll go with, you know, maybe I have um, a king who wants information about his daughter from her lady in waiting and he starts with a simple like unescalated strategy of asking her and then she uh starts out with a simple unescalated strategy of just declining and then he's going to escalate he'll go to uh bribing her and she'll escalate she'll maybe decide well he's he really wants this information i don't want to betray 
the princess so I'm, I'm going to distract him by flirting and then you know maybe this works for a while but then the king gets mad and he threatens her and now she's got to go to her top strategy of uh maybe you know providing false information so that she can keep the princess's secrets um but just knowing where the characters are going to escalate to really lets me write scenes that kind of wind up more dynamic and I don't wind up with the characters stuck in a place where they're just arguing the same point back and forth. Right, right. Okay, that's a great tip. Uh, and maybe if you if you think of it, uh, you can send me the link for that one and I'll put it in the description as well. Oh yeah, absolutely. Okay, great. Uh, I'm getting so much, so much uh, great advice here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks so much. Okay, so we've done that one. And just tell me if you have to go, okay? It's perfect. Okay. How much time do you have? Um, I, I could probably go for another half hour. Um, but oh you know, well, we've we already done it. Oh well, I guess we got, it was. But it's been about forty-five minutes. Okay, so I'll try to. I'll try to. Um, okay, we've already covered that one. That's good. I mean, we can. We can do. Uh, tell me if you need to go as well. Oh yeah, no, I'm fine. Um, oh yeah, okay. I'm not sure if this is something that you're interested in, but. Um, have uh have you i'm sure you have ursula Le Guin. have you oh read yeah definitely. and she has written uh well i don't know quite a bit but she's certainly written about the difference between genre and literary fiction or lit fic and i don't have you read any of her musings on that subject i i haven't actually no okay. well i think she because um sh her books are Sometimes they're looked at as genre, but personally, I mean, I think they're, there's, there's, I think, some discussion about whether they should be placed in, uh, whether they should be viewed as genre or whether they should be viewed as literary fiction. Mm -hmm. And I think if, if I understand her position, it's that genre and literary fiction, it's an artificial distinction that it should be more like category. Well, is the literary fiction about sci fi, like, for instance, um, uh, the Handmaid's Tale, right? You could argue right. that that's kind of like sci-fi-ish, but um, I think we've we more or less say that it's literary fiction. Yeah. But um, yeah, so uh, Ursula Le Guin, she, I think her her stance is that well, just you know, um, it's it's of a certain subject matter, and so we shouldn't make this artificial distinction between genre and and literature. We should just put them all together because otherwise we're sort of skimming the cream off the genre and saying no this isn't genre this is literary fiction which in a sense is not that fair to genre writers right yeah i think i agree with that i think um you know any genre writer any genre book with something to say can wind up being considered literary fiction and i think that the best written books in every genre are excellent um you know are quality literature. Um, yeah, I, so when I was in college, um, you know, I went to college for writing. I did a creative writing major and, um, you know, the, the understanding was that in workshops, you were going to write literary fiction. This was the only serious fiction that existed. And this is what we were studying. And I feel like, um, yeah, I feel like I kind of got duped into thinking that genre fiction was not a worthy goal of pursuing, but it turns out that cozy mysteries are what I love. So um, yeah, I think definitely uh, books of any genre can be totally excellent. They can totally be literature. And, uh, you know, I guess I also think you should write what you love. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I agree with you 100%. But it's interesting. Okay, so you mentioned that you took a degree in um, creative writing. Yeah. Would, would you recommend like for someone who a young person who is or, or older, whatever, you can be of any age, uh, who is thinking about getting a degree in uh, creative writing? Could you speak to that? Yeah, I, I can. Um, so I have some strong opinions about that. Um, okay, good. So I would say 
Yeah, I would say don't. I would say don't go to college for this. Um, I mean, you know, do it if you want to for fun, but don't think that college is going to provide you with the tools you need to be a professional writer. So um, I feel like in colleges, writing is, is often taught in this workshop atmosphere where students produce work and then it's critiqued. And instead of ever learning a how-to for how do you introduce characters, how do you create character arcs? Instead, people are just told, well, you do something and then we'll tell you if you did a good job. And I feel like this is not a reasonable way to teach people. I think um, if, say, my daughter wanted to become a writer, I would sit her down with my top six favorite craft books. I would perhaps buy her admission to a few um, private courses that are available online. I would spend dramatically less than I would spend sending her to um, college for this. And um, and I think she'd wind up with more information faster. I also think, um, you know, the other thing about college is that it only focused on the craft. It really, there was no point where they said, okay, here's how you approach a literary agent. Here is how you query magazines. Um, and honestly, I've had this conversation with many people who are in different fields, people who work in, you know, um, computer science or uh, other fields. And they feel like really college was great fun and taught you cool stuff, but did not actually prepare you for a career. If I wanted to prepare a young writer for a career, I would do it with a few specific books and courses, and it would cover not just craft, but the practical business of writing. Have you done a YouTube uh, video on that? Um, I'm planning to someday. Uh, okay. I haven't. Well, haven't do you, totally could you recommend one or two books uh, on the craft of writing that you would recommend to your daughter? Yeah, absolutely. So um, probably, all right, I'm going to give you two favorites. Um, okay. Save the Cat, which is yes. uh, wildly popular. And yeah, you've heard of that. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's a little book. Yeah, Blake Snyder. Yeah. Um, it's approachable enough to be read, I think, by a teenager and a, a novice writer can immediately start getting some stuff out of it. But it's also deep enough that I think even if you've been writing for several years, you can really get something out of it. Um, and then my other favorite is much less well known, and that's the secrets, um, the secrets of story by Matt Bird, um, and that's a great book. There are just so many um, deep thoughts that immediately let me start putting ideas together for stories. I have not heard of that one, so thank you. Yeah, you should definitely check it out. I. Um, if I'm with a group of writers and we're talking about our favorite craft book, this is the one I'm going to beg them to buy. It's just really wonderful. Okay. So uh, have you read um, uh, Screenwriting? I think it's called Screenwriting by Sid Field. Um, no, I haven't read that one yet. It, it is on my Kindle, um, but I haven't gotten to it yet. It's beautifully written too, which is always a nice thing. Cool. Uh, okay, so I think we're... Uh, I just, I guess I wanted to ask you about um, your reading preferences. Like when you were a kid, what did you read as opposed to now? What do you read? Are they, is it the same? Is it different? Right. Um, I mean, I've read everything. I'll read fantasy, sci-fi, mysteries, nonfiction. Um, you know, I think um, probably I fell in love with Cozy Mysteries by reading Elizabeth Peters. I remember um, I was on a car trip with my parents and um, my mom had gotten this Elizabeth Peters book from the library and I was like 15. So I had already decided that anything my mom wanted to listen to was gonna be super boring. And I just I just uh, opened up my drawing pad and tuned out, but it kept just pulling me back in because it was just so funny and and funny not in the sense that there were jokes and wordplay but funny in the sense that um 
the characters were just deeply flawed and had strong perspectives and it was this wonderful character-based humor that I think is is oh yeah that's amazing to write. yeah yeah, yeah. The best. um okay uh is there anything that you would like to say or any like comment you liked if, you know talking to maybe writers that um are thinking about taking this on as a profession or perhaps as a you know semi-professionally do you have any advice that you could give them yeah I mean I'd say you know writing is a hard gig it is but at the end of the day we are very fortunate to have a passion for something that is so endlessly interesting and um so kind of good for humanity you know I think writing helps readers grow their empathy. It helps them feel inspired and understood. And um, yeah, it is a hard gig, but it's worth it. And it is never too early to start taking yourself seriously, start putting yourself out there and asking the world to take you seriously. Awesome. So the last question, okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> if you could go back in time and tell yourself one piece of advice about writing, what would it be? Honestly, it would be, um, it would be right every day. You know, this is not a piece of advice that is uh, particularly unique to me. You've probably heard it in a bunch of different places, but if I had written every day from the time I was 13 till now, um, you know, I'd have a huge body of work and I feel like I understand a lot more. So that's the main thing, I think. Awesome. Thank you so much. I've really enjoyed this and I've learned a lot. Yeah, thank you so much. I, I'm so excited to do this. Okay, so I will try to have this up by, well, definitely by Tuesday, but okay. maybe by Friday, Saturday. I don't know. Depends maybe if the editing goes well. Great. Yeah. Um, send me the link um, and I will, you know, I will push it to all my places. And... Oh, thank you. Yeah, you're That's welcome. That's so nice. Okay, well, I hope you have a great evening. Yeah, you too. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh, thank you.